Good evening. Uh, welcome to our series, Jewish Life is Waking Up. We're joined tonight by my teacher and friend, Rabbi Ed Feinstein, and my teacher of many years, Dr. Aviva Zornberg. Um, she's known worldwide for her, her Torah, for her books, and we'll be talking more about it, but for her ways of reading text. And I have uh, been studying with her personally for many, many years. And I'm great, greatly, greatly honored that she is our teacher today and our, our guest today on our, on our series. And of course, we're exploring um, this moment in history and maybe this larger moment in the postmodern world and trying to understand Jewish life in the context of this world or the world in context of Jewish life. And so Aviva, as I mentioned, you are a teacher for many around the globe. You have uh, written many books about Torah and the way you teach, the way you teach Torah has changed the way many people approach and study and relate to the text. And I wonder how you came to teach in this way um, if it was immediate, if it was over a process of time, and how you would describe uh, this method. Uh, first of all, I feel very honored to be here, and it's a great pleasure personally to be with you, Noah, and to meet Ed. Um, well, it certainly happened over time, and I feel awkward even to use the word method because it was so much a matter of, of groping in the dark. I knew from the beginning, I knew something. I knew that I had a way of wanting to hear Torah taught. And whenever I heard something like it, uh, I would be extremely happy. <laughs> and there were certain teachers I had, uh, first among them, my own father, Zichron Levracha, who taught in that way. So in a sense, it's not surprising that I would have become attached to that way of teaching. And I'll just say a word or two about what, how it struck me at the beginning. At the beginning, it was, a, the, the method was, if that's a method, um, simply to go through the text verse by verse with my father commenting on things that struck him, either philological meaning of the words or actually associative. What it associated with for him other texts in the Torah, things in life, things in his life, episodes in his life. Uh, he had a, a very dramatic life behind him with all the troubles of European Jewry um, in his history, uh, modern, modern European history, uh, growing up in a small village where his parents were the only Jews in Galicia. Um, going to study finally with his grandfather, meaning it meant he didn't actually live at home in his, in his later childhood. Uh, he lived with his grandparents because they, he could learn Torah with them. And so his Torah was fraught with all kinds of emotional experiences of, of having to be transplanted and a certain kind of love for his grandparents. And he would share all this with me as we were learning. And then afterwards, Vienna, university and uh, becoming a rabbi and the Nazis and the flight from Vienna with my mother and the, the arrival as immigrants in England. And so with a history like that, um, I had a sense of Torah as epic on some level, that the Torah was so important and so full of, of meaning in every word that every word in some way associated for him. I could only witness this at that time. I didn't have any sense that I could have that kind of grasp. But I, th I think one of the things that made it for me urgent to take the Torah for myself was uh, the Shoah background, actually, um, and the sense of unspeakable trauma somewhere behind the present day and the way in which he would talk about God without in any way trying to preach to me. There was absolutely none of that. It was just a kind of confidence that what he thought and believed would somehow pass on to me, um, just genetically. <laughs> um, 
and but but the sense of once I became old enough, which means about eight, nine, ten, uh, to begin really to imagine the horrors that he'd been through, it raised large questions for me about what is meant by this phrase and that phrase that God is full of loving kindness. You know, simple things like that. How how do you understand that? Uh, given the reality that my father represented uh, in the flesh. He wasn't, he wasn't hesitant to talk about what he knew, but he did it in a, in a sparing way. Um, so with that background, I think from the beginning, there was a sense of urgency, somewhere of intensity about learning Torah. It couldn't be just kind of the wallpaper uh, in my life. Um, it was the lifeline. And uh, the, his love of Torah just transferred effortlessly to me and to my sister. He would le learn with us every day for, for you know, a good period of time. We had, this was our daily uh, experience. And then later when I went to university, uh, again, there's, there was this sense of being on my own, a certain kind of loneliness, which I think I've always had um, of being alone. We were rather isolated in our community at home and then I went to university and I was one of the very few religious Jewish students there. I went to Cambridge. And again, there was a sense of, of, of the need to keep a, a strong inner life going. And my way was very much through study. Um, other things came into it, but, but study was, was the key. And gradually, I think I just developed that sense that I had felt that my father had of the the radiance of the words and the way the words invited other words and and that there was something fertile about every time one one came into contact with with words of torah uh, later to answer the question fully um, uh, later when i began to teach then i really began to experiment and i think the main way i started teaching was through through narrative that i would I think in the end, if there's one way of summing up what I try to do, it's that I tell a story rather than investigate uh, a, 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 an intellectual problem in the text. I try to tell a meaningful story that has about it something new. And I think that's one of the themes in my life that I just have an absolute compelling need. It's not even a, a wish, it's a need um, for Hidush to see things differently. Otherwise, it's just boring. <laughs> and I have a very high threshold for boringness. Um, it's very, I, have, I feel if, some, if I've heard something before, it's already boring. It, I need somewhere to invent, to create every time. Uh, and it's a need of, of, of who I am. So that, of course, led me on my on my path because uh, it led me to certain commentaries certain whom, in whom I found that value of chidush, of, of renovating, innovating, of trying to create anew the text that was available to everybody. Um, and I think that was a key to the later development as well as I came in contact with really newer ways of thinking, uh, like the psychoanalytic uh, way of thinking and like postmodernism. These all became challenges to try to incorporate the difficult and the strange into the familiar in some way to, to put them together and to create something new. I think that's, that will do is a rather long answer. I appreciate I that. I, I, can, I, can I ask you, I want to pursue that just a little bit farther. Yes. To, to open an Aviva Zornberg Midrash on a piece of text is to enter an intellectual conversation. It's the world's greatest dinner table because here is, here is the text of the Torah surrounded by Sigmund Freud, William Blake, William Shakespeare, William Falk, all the Williams, <laughs> William Faulkner, um, <laughs> in, American and uh, Western literature, the psychoanalytic tradition, this philosophical tradition. And there's such a rich conversation around this table. It's the most beautiful intellectual conversation that there is. Um, so the, the, the question is, how, how do you come by that? How, how does that happen? Do, and, and I know this is a very naive and silly question, but I know that many of your readers would love to know. Do you start with the Torah text and then find the 
the, the commentaries in all of the world's literature? Or do you start with the world's literature and say that reminds me of a story of how does Aviva Zornberg come to these connections that are so precious? Okay, um, I always start with the text. Uh, I've been, f formally, I've always been teaching Parsha Tashavua, the Parsha of the week, you know, the section of the Torah of the week. Um, and so I start by going through that, finding a, finding a passage that strikes me as it invites me, you know, it sort of stretches out its antennae towards me. And, and then I start looking at all the commentaries, that is all the traditional Jewish commentaries. And I spend many, many hours when I'm creating a new, a new class, um, I spend many, many hours doing that. And this, this goes back to when I began teaching, um, which was like 40 years ago, something like that, 30 years ago, I can't, I've lost track, um, 1980, 30 years ago. Um, and, uh, and I go through everything, taking notes, and then at almost the last minute, just be <laughs> shortly before I have to give the class, I sit myself down and in, in something of a panic, I try to produce, to, 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 to amplify what comes back to me from all that reading. Uh, in other words, it's a kind of intuitive process of picking on certain things that struck me as I went through all those commentaries, using them to flesh out uh, an idea, and I had I have no idea how it's going to end out end up until I've gone through it. That is, until I've written my notes, I don't know how, what the shape of the thing will be. And as I'm doing it, other other texts come to mind. I'll remember a passage in Shakespeare. I'll remember a passage in um, in George Herbert, or because literature is very close to my heart. That's that was what I studied for my secular education at Cambridge. Uh, I did a doctorate in English literature, um, specializing in George Eliot. And, and so I, by the time the years had passed and I'd done more and more reading, my interests had, had complicated and unfolded and there were a lot of books on my shelf, all underlined. And I would just pull down a book and find the passage I'm thinking of and, 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 and put it into my notes and then try it out in teaching. And I also had the great blessing and advantage of uh, teaching. My teaching schedule involved teaching one class a week, four, five, six times a week. So I would, in essence, keep refining over those four, five, six givings of the, of the shi'ur. I would, I would cut it and whittle it and try it different ways and see what works best and how to get at the form that's hidden within all the material. And uh, that's been really the process all along. Um, to, to this day, if I'm, when I'm creating a new, uh, a new class and, and if I'm using material I've used before, it really involves going back to the ground again and really trying to build it up again from scratch. Um, it's, a, it's a very similar but different process. So that's, that's the process and it involves all my passions. You know, it's, I don't quote anything I'm not passionate about, um, which is these days it's literature and psychoanalysis. Psychoanalytic texts are, have, have been like poetry to me, um, have brought me deeper into the inner life. And, and so they are a joy for me. They help me in coming to understand what I'm trying to understand. I also have thought many times about how um, you are not satisfied with a simple answer. That um, many times you're probing to look for something, even if you leave it unresolved, um, even if it's uh, uh, difficult, right? And sometimes there's uh, an impetus with religion to find like a, a more resolved answer. And, and I wonder about your curiosity and your ability to go to sometimes difficult places. Um, and I, and uh, as you mentioned, the faith that you learned from your father and from your life, 
And I, I wonder about those two poles. And I wonder if you think they serve one another. And, um, and if that's too easy, so be it. But I, I wonder if they work in some kind of tension. I think, I think they work together. Uh, there may be tension, but it's not the kind of, what moves me is not the kinds of questions that have to do with, you know, the position of women in Judaism. Uh, you know, that's not to start with, that's not the question. I could read a particular story, uh, like the story of Yehuda and Tamar, with a sense of outrage, you know, with a sense of outrage for Tamar's position. Um, but that would emerge from the text and from the commentaries and from my world. From um, God is is very important in all this. Although I'm, I don't talk easily about, uh, I don't use the, I don't use the name of God actually so often, um, because um, I think again it's partly to do with my background, in which it was clear that it was all about holiness and and so on. But very little of that kind of language very little of it, very little reference to halakha even. The word halakha, never law, you know, it was just, this is what we do, or it's a mitzvah to do it, or something. It was like just softer. It was a kind of softer feel about the whole thing. I think maybe my, my father's Hasidic background had something to do with that. Um, so for me, the curiosity is, is absolutely urgent. It's not a kind of, oh, isn't that interesting? It's, um, I need it in order to live. <laughs> I need it in order to feel alive, you know, that I need to find something new, chidush. You know, it's, so I, I take shelter under the word chidush, <laughs> um, which is obviously a very good thing, um, creativity and so on. But um, it, it's really more primal than that. It, it's just a, a, a very strong need to come up for air somewhere, to come out of the material and find something that I, I can I can open my lungs with, you know, I can, um, so it's, it's, I can't tolerate what things, things that seem to me um, banal, you know, hackneyed, you know, I, just, I really suffer, you know, I just kind of, <laughs> um, but to, yeah, and I think the Torah demands that, you know, for me, and, and, and I feel that's when I'm closest to God. And again, <laughs> excuse me for <laughs> publicizing uh, private things, but, uh, you know, that's when, for me, that's, you know, some people, it's when they daven, you know, when they pray. Um, and there is that too. But, um, but, but for me, it's that. And it's, it's just great, great relief in my life that, that I have this. So I would say it's a need for depth and for newness. Yeah. Not the surface, but it has to be something complicated. Otherwise, and that's why maybe sometimes I don't come to a resolution. So such a clear resolution. Although I really work at trying to, you know, because I want to come up with something that has a, a form to it, that it has a, a structure of some kind. Um, but it's it's such a struggle. <laughs> It's a struggle to move through the material too. I know, I know I speak for many of your students where we feel the grateful recipients of that struggle and um, uh, learn and often join the struggle, right? Like carry it forward. I think reading my work is a bit of a struggle. <laughs> it's not so easy for everybody. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm always very gratified when someone says, I read your books. You know, I just think, you know, you're, 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 you're good sport. <laughs> and, and good work at that. And, and maybe this is a good segue because you've, um, you're willing to teach us a little something this morning or this evening. And um, we, we settled on the, on, you've been teaching for, for many years on, on, on trauma in the sources and, and in life. And uh, specifically, you call it the, the disorderly or the apparently meaningless. Mm -hmm. And it's the signature of our age, of our postmodern age. And specifically in, in Torah, there are midrashic interpretations of a, um, a very fraught moment 
the moment when Sarah, our mother, is, is told in different ways of what her husband, Abraham, possibly did or didn't do on Mount Moriah with their son, Isaac, the Akedah, the binding of Isaac, the almost sacrifice of their son. And what that the possibility of that moment opens up for her. And uh, I was wondering, we were hoping you would be willing to walk us through a few examples of the, the potential of the apparent meaningless in that moment for Sarah. Yes, um, I have to say that this, this originated this whole story. Uh, originated for me it's many years ago before the word trauma became popular. I remember I, I, I suddenly came upon it in my mind and I thought oh that's what they call it don't they? Isn't there a word like that? Um, trauma and I looked it up and it means wound in Greek uh, and of course it's not a physical wound it's, it's everything but the physical. Uh, it's having forgotten actually the event it, because it's unbearable and then in some way bumping into it and being forced to realize that you have no, you have no means of dealing with it. That you, you are just incapable of, of meeting it. Um, and for me then, uh, the Akedah, as experienced by the binding of Isaac, as experienced by Sarah, became emblematic of a lot of the suffering in the world a lot of what my imagination had, had asked, you know, had, been, had suffered over in terms of imagining the actual deaths of, of so many people in our generation, in my generation, um, the unbearable, the unspeakable. And of course I had to deal with that, you know, even so there is no easy bottom line, but that's where God has to be, otherwise he's nowhere. You know, if, if, if there isn't some sense that God is in this, then we might as well just forget it, you know, because that's, that's the truth. That's, although one prefers not to think about it most of the time. So if I can start um, just just pointing to a few sources. Yes, of, would, yes would, would you like? I'll share this, go ahead and share the screen for everyone. Yes, thank you. So it's the Rashi first. Yeah, thank you. Yes. So we read that uh, Abraham came to, that Sarah died, that's all we hear about her death, and, and Abraham, Abraham, her husband, came to eulogize her and to weep for her, you know, to, to, to bewail her, as it says here, and to weep for her. And here Rashi makes a comment, which is really, it's, it wasn't at all necessary for him to add this, but he wanted to insert this comment from the Midrash. He, he, he took it from the Midrash. And what he says here, the narrative of the death of Sarah follows immediately on that of the binding of Isaac, which is true. If you look in the text, it's right away afterwards. Why? If they come next to each other, it's because they have some connection with each other. Because through the announcement of the binding, that her son had been made ready for sacrifice and had almost been sacrificed, she received a great shock uh, that's, um, we don't exactly see that. What we read in the text is that her soul flew away from her. Her soul flew away from her and she died, which we might understand to be that she had some kind of a, a heart attack or a, a stroke of some kind, and she died. Now that would be to understand it on a kind of medical level, that, that, that the shock of the news was too great and she died. However, um, I don't think that's the only level at which we can think of it, the medical level. And of course, the main question that arises from this Rashi, and he wants you to think that she died because of not the fact that he was slaughtered, but the, the, the report that he had almost been slaughtered. Someone told her the news that he had almost been slaughtered. Um, and in that case, he's alive. So you would think in a way, bottom line, he's alive, he's good news, he's, it's good news. But no, she dies of it. So Rashi is telling the story now from his Midrashic sources in the most brief, concise way possible, so stark, so that you have to notice that you, you don't understand why she died, um, really. 
um, and then you, you wonder, and in, in a way, you are traumatized at this point because you don't know what to do with what he's just said. He said something that's obviously very intense, but I don't quite get it. You know, what, what is that? So the Maharal, who is one of the super commentaries on Rashi, I didn't put this on the page because it's really longer than necessary. Um, he simply says this, and he, he looks, he simply witnesses how it is in life. He says, when a person realizes that something didn't happen to him by a very small margin, that it missed him, the bullet missed him by a very small margin, it's the way of a human being, in other words, it's human nature, to enter into bahala. Bahala is shock, disorientation, disorder, in a very understate, that's an understatement, a feeling of being totally, the ground is cut, cut under my feet. Why? Because the bullet, the bullet missed me by so much. Now, a superficial reading would just say, well, be happy. You know, the bullet, bullet, yep. Yeah. Surely your main thing should be then to be grateful and make a kiddush to celebrate um, that you, you survived. But here we go into a strange shadow land now of almost, where things almost happen. And I wanted to share with you a couple of the sources from which Rashi found his material, where he found the material, longer versions of the story that explain a little more, but still raise emotional questions uh, that are of utmost uh, seriousness and, and gravity. So here we have Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, which is, it's, a, it's like a dream collection, Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer. It's full of vivid and uncanny imagery. So how do we have it here? When Abraham returned from Mount Moriah in peace, doesn't exactly say that, but all right, the anger of Satan, Samael is Satan, was kindled. He, he was furious, for he saw that the desire of his heart to frustrate the offering of our father Abraham had not been realized. There's a double negative there. Satan is frustrated because he hasn't managed to make nonsense of Abraham's willingness, his, 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 his obedient response to God. What did he do? He went and said to Sarah, have you heard, haven't you heard what's been happening in the world? So it's just passing the time of day, casual gossip. You heard what's been going on? She said to him, no. He said to her, your husband Abraham has taken your son Isaac and slain him and offered him up as a burnt offering upon the altar. You know, so here suddenly there's a whole spate of words. You know what he's done? He's done this and that and that. And the boy, the Isaac, was howling, miyalel in Hebrew, wailing, howling. It's an animal word, right? It's the word for jackals in the wilderness uh, in the text of the Torah. It's an empty wailing sound. And the boy was howling because he was not able to be saved. That is, he was howling helplessly. And here is the mother hearing in her mind now, her son wailing helplessly. Immediately, she began to weep and to howl. Same word. Three times. Three times, corresponding to the three sustained notes of the shofar, which is called tekia, and also three howlings which represent to the three disconnected short notes of the shofar, which are called the trua. And I'm mostly concerned with the trua, with the trua sound. That is the yalala sound. That is short, stabbing, completely, completely desperate sounds, sounds of casting around for, for anything, anything, any context to put oneself in, like a fragment. It's a fragment of a sound. It's not a human sound. And how do we remember these sounds? By blowing the shofar. That is, whenever we blow the shofar, and that's the implication in, a, in, in the whole range of Midrashim on this, on this theme. Um, whenever we blow the shofar, one of our purposes is to recall Sarah's death. 
the more classic explanation, of course, is that the shofar is made of a ram's horn, and it was it reminds us of Abraham Abraham finding the the ram, uh, which he sacrificed instead of his son. But there is this alternative uh, stream of interpretation, and here it is. Sarah and the tragic way she died. She died wailing, as in a way mimicking her son's wailing, a kind of situation in which all she can do is mimic helplessly her son's helpless death, because what else is there to do? She's not going to say anything. And then her soul flew away and she died. The same, that is in some way, there was just a moment of great shock and the impact was so intense that she died of it. The interesting thing is, one of the interesting things is, um, that if you look at li further literature, midrashic and, and liturgical commentary on the blowing of the shofar, what they say is something like this, that we blow the shofar, that God may remember her cries, Sarah's cries, as if it's going to help us somehow in our dire situation on Rosh Hashanah, in our very, the crucial situation we're in, if God will remember the way she dies and will act as an atonement for us. That is, in some way, there is great credit given to the way she dies, as if there was a kind of power in her powerlessness, that her ability to face a certain truth, which is a truth of meaninglessness, that's, I think, what the Yalala means. She, she hasn't got a word to say. There's nothing rational she can say about it, and she just dies. Well, here I can understand why she dies. After all, Satan has told the story in a diabolical way, as if he, her son really was killed. So that is a kind of, I would say, it's a kind of simple version of the Midrash, because she dies of the shock of thinking that her son was killed. And of course, the, the pathos of the mother in a situation like this is absolutely a, right, it's a, such a classic theme uh, in other religions too, the mother wailing up over the sacrificed son. Uh, yes, and, and we, all, we all move to that. But now let's have a look at another version of the Midrash, the Midrash Tan Chuma. At that moment, Satan came to Sarah, and he appeared to her in the image of Isaac. This is a different story. He looked like Isaac, and when she saw him, she said to him, My son, what has your father done to you? That is, again, your imagination has immediately to leap into the story and to ask, why does she ask him that question? What has your father? There must be something about the way he looks. And so that's that feeling that you have to contribute to the story as you're reading it. You have to fill it out because otherwise you don't quite understand. Right? I think that's a way of dealing with disorder. Exactly. It's using your imagination to deal with a story that doesn't quite make sense. But here he answers, Satan Isaac answers, my father took me and took me up mountains and down through valleys and he took me to the top of a particular mountain and they built an altar and he arranged the, the, the offering, the, the wood there and he set up the wood. A whole process, stage by stage, all very orderly and all remorselessly aimed at its end. What's going to be at the end? And he bound me on the altar and he took the knife to slaughter me. The ilule. Underlined here. If it hadn't been, right? Ilule is a wonderful conjunction, I suppose, in, in Midrashic Hebrew that means had it not been, yes, if it had not been for the fact that God at the last moment called to Abraham not to touch the child, I should already have been slaughtered. Now, here is Yitzchak, Isaac, telling the story in the first person apparently. Sarah is not to know that this is Satan incarnate. That Satan is playing on her, on her nerves. I don't know how, how to put it exactly. And what is it that kills her this time? Let's let see the end here. Um, if it had not been, then I should already have been slaughtered. She, he didn't manage to finish the speech, the word, 
the thing before her soul flew away. As it says, Abraham came to mourn for her. In other words, this time, what is it? So you're tempted for a moment to take a kind of easy way out and to say, oh, it's one of those stories where you don't, you don't ironically, you just miss hearing the happy end of the story. Uh, and uh, and you just you die just before the good news that that actually he survived. Um, but of course that won't work here. You try that out, and then you realize no no that that won't work. And this is an emotional exercise. It's not an intellectual exercise. You it's as if your 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 imagination immediately has recourse to this explanation, and you think no no that won't work because after all he's alive in front of her. As far as she knows, this is Isaac alive. So she doesn't think he's dead. So what does she, what does she die of? And it's leaving it now again for the reader with the clue of that first person narrative, a live human being who is saying, I should be slaughtered at this moment. There is nothing that divides me from slaughter, that says me, except that God called out at the last minute, as if that's just a hair's breadth of, of a difference and a sense of a, a kind of unbearable contingency to events. The things just happen. Suddenly you know, something happens and you know, there I was and well, a hair's breadth, all right, I wasn't, I wasn't killed. And she dies of that in some way. Um, let's go to the next source now, and then we can try to think about them together. Um, this is the fullest one and uh, the longest one. I'll read it very quickly. Um, it starts right by an address to the reader. Um, the, uh, the, the, sage, the sages say to the reader, Abraham didn't have any joy in my world. He was not. And you want to rejoice? So here is a kind of attack on the reader. You know, you think that happiness is a is a plausible end in this world? So it's a really pessimistic beginning. Even Abraham, who was a happyish kind of person, he was a kind of person who was feasting and being with people. And you know what the real truth of his life was? There was born to him finally at 100 years old, a, su a son after all those barren years. In the end, God said to him, take your son and sacrifice him. And he went a journey of three days. And after three days, he saw a cloud on the mountain. And he said to his son, do you see what I see? Do you see with the same eyes that I see? And Isaac answered, yes. What do you see? He said to him. The father said to him, what do you see? And he said, um, I see a cloud tied to the mountain. In other words, a divine sign that that mountain is significant, that that's our destination. So Abraham and Isaac are in sync somewhere. They do both see the same way. And then he says to the two servants, Yishmael and Eliezer, do you see anything? And they say no. And then he says to them rather scathingly, since you don't see anything, um, and this donkey doesn't see anything, then uh, stay here with the donkey. <laughs> while we go to that place of fate. You know, lucky you and poor you, that you don't see that religious moment that is waiting for us, that moment of destiny with God. And so then he takes Isaac, his son, he brings him up mountains and down valleys, the same long odyssey, um, until in the end, um, you, know, it goes, it goes, you know, we know the whole story now, we've heard it already, and then Sarah says at that point to Isaac, and this time it's, uh, sorry, I'm, I've just lost a bit here. Yes. So the same story, if it had not been, yes, if it had not been that the angel called out, uh, I should already have been slaughtered. Okay. Teda Shaken. You can underline that now. <laughs> Teda Shaken. Uh, know, dear reader, that that's true. The story I've just told you, that's how it really happens. I think it's the most significant phrase in the, in, the, in the Midrash. I'm not just inventing a story here. How do we know? Because Isaac, in, his, in, in full life afterwards, the survivor, came back to his mother. And she said to him, where have you been, my son? And he said to her, the whole story again, my father took me uphill and down dale and all the rest of it, the whole story. And then she said to him, see the difference, 
Woe upon the son of a drunken woman. Duravita is one translation for it. It's a little problematic. How do they translate it here? Um, the son of a hapless woman. Well, it, it's, it's an easier translation. I, I'm beside myself somewhere. I, I don't know what to do with myself. And she interrogates him in this version. She doesn't just hear a story passively. She says, just a minute. She's a woman of, of strong mind. And it's that mind that gets shattered at this moment. And she said, are you telling me that if it hadn't been for a last minute call from some angel, you would already have been slaughtered? Is this the world we live in? And he says to her, yes. And this is Isaac speaking. Not, not, a, not Satan. At that moment, she cries out six cries corresponding to the six tekiot in this, in this case. Uh, also sounds of the shofar. And, people, and they said she didn't manage to finish it before she died. As it says, Abraham came to mourn Sarah. So what do we have here? We have, basically, we have Sarah being played on like a sensitive instrument by the impossible and unspeakable suffering that there is in the world. So what do you think Abraham's final fate would be? Have, coming to find his wife dead when he comes straight from Mount Moriah, as it were, after this strange story with his son, and then he finds his wife dead. Something about the irony and the sheer chance nature of events as they seem to us in this world. I almost hesitate to call it the seeming meaninglessness of the world, because it seems to me too pious a way of putting it. You know, it's all very well to sit afterwards and say, well, on, on the whole, thinking it over and with the use of my, my creative imagination, I've managed somewhere to get beyond that moment. I think in a sense, we can never get beyond that moment. It's the, it's the kind of ultimate moment for those who have gone through it. That was the ultimate moment for those who've gone through a, a trauma of that kind. It's the moment of howl, howl, howl of King Lear, when he realizes that Cordelia has been killed at the end of, the, of, a, of a play in which everything seemed to be turning out well. You know, the, the righteous were being rewarded and the, and the evil were being punished and suddenly everything flips and he finds out that Cordelia has been killed and he cries out five times, howl, which is a similar hollow, non-human, non-human pre-verbal sound. It's a sound of surely a kind of onomatopoeia. It's imitating some kind of hollow sound, which is then imitated by the shofar. The shofar brings it up. And then on Rosh Hashanah, when we have so many words to say to God and so many stories to tell him of things that we think we have, we have something to say to God, something comes and in a way undercuts all that. Now, that is, that's really almost unbearable. For me, that, that story, that way of focusing on a, a fragmentary moment that's based on a midrash that has different forms to it, different versions of it, I think it's a struggle that the sages have here to deal with something that's unspeakable. And it's, it's a reminder to us that we have to deal with that. And that the world contains that, that the world, you know, open the newspapers any day. Uh, these days I'm extremely, in the times we're living in, I'm oversensitized perhaps to that. And I just, I tend to find myself just closing the newspaper and saying, Ugh, you know, it's just unbearable. Now, what are we supposed to do with this? Where does God come into this? Why do the sages bring it up? In this kind of unbearable and subtle detail, it could have been slightly like, more like this, it could have been slightly more like that, but somewhere trying to say something that you think doesn't belong in religious language. In, in, in a text of you know, religious language, surely always is about, in the end, it's about the happy end. In the end, it is how things are beautifully ordered how the end is always good. And if, but if you are going to be useful in the world, I think in some way, I don't mean useful, useful, but if you are, you're going to be truthful in the world, 
you're going to have to acknowledge that there is no understanding certain things. There is no understanding and there's no subsuming it into some larger pattern and saying, oh yeah, you know, ultimately it'll make sense. I don't know what that means. It may be true, but in my human terms, I don't know what it means. And so I think for me personally, this represents the problem and the work, the work of God in the world, right? The, my work, my work in trying in some way to understand that too happens and that's a moment at which I break down that's a moment in which I don't have any responses why play that out on Rosh Hashanah why actually reenact it and so it seems to me that Sarah is in some way being depicted in this association with the shofar and the power of the shofar to redeem She's being depicted as a kind of epic heroine, precisely in her going beyond any kind of normal, rational re resources, you know, ways in which we normally try to, to round, the, round the sharp corners, you know, to, to, make, things, to make things easier. Um, this is what the Eshkodesh says, the Piachechner, um, 19, uh, the, the Rebbe of Warsaw, the outskirts of Warsaw, he had a community during the Shoah, during the Holocaust, to which he made many drashot, talking about the now, I, we reality of what it is to live on that edge. And using texts, using texts, bringing in texts of all kinds, not to come to a neat, optimistic conclusion, but simply to give a sense of life now. Life with all the death that we know now, with, with everything that, that we know. And he gives a great deal of credit to Sarah. And he says about, about Sarah that she is the most, in her speechlessness, in her, her death without words, in her speechlessness, she is the most eloquent, eloquent um, spokesman for us as if she is saying to God, and he says this, who could say this other than someone who is right in the middle of that, a situation like that? And he says, she is saying to God, there are sufferings that are simply impossible. You can't do this to us. There is, we, we, we like to believe that certain moderate forms of suffering can be refinement, that they can in some way refine us, they can make us better, but extreme suffering does nothing but kill. Okay. It does nothing but wound and distort. You can't put people through this. You can't put Jews through this. Now, strangely, that protest, which he, he, he gives as, as the heroism of Sarah, this is, this is, the, this is the, in a way, the, what her life was, was moving towards, such a moment in which he speaks for Israel, um, doesn't lead to a bitterness as one reads his text. You would think, so the bottom line is protest and despair and outrage. But in a strange way, it's not so. And I can't quite put into words in what way it's not so. But there is a sense of even this somewhere we can put, we can find a place for in our imagination. Not in our sense of order but in our sense of imagination. And our imagination goes everywhere. It goes to the highest and it goes to the lowest. And we know how our imaginations encompass many things. So we've found a space for something that actually we couldn't talk about. It'd be very hard. I, I, I could never have talked about my feelings about the Shoah, my real, until I came across this story. You know, and then I came, and somewhere I had a, a way of talking about it which is a great relief on some level, one's humanity is, is acknowledged at that moment in the protest. There are no answers in this, in this sense. So I think something like that, perhaps one could perhaps um, have recourse to in thinking of the disorder and the anxiety, sometimes unbearable for some of us in which we live. Um, I feel that, that um, thinking about that uh, and empathizing with that, not cutting oneself off, 
around it, but empathizing with that, I think simply brings one to an unbearable depth in human experience, but it is a depth. It's, we are actually, um, we, we, are, we are alive as long as we are alive. <laughs> we are alive in the truth of it, in the truth of it, and in the prayer that it should never happen again. We have to have no more of this. So it's such a profound um, teaching, and I think what is hard to put into words is um, it, it doesn't insult someone who has gone through something very serious, and it doesn't insult it with a resolution, but it instead just acknowledges it. And yes. by connecting also to ritual, it allows us to participate in it and to know it, part of the depth of life. You put it very beautifully, thank you. That, that helped me, yes, thank you. It's not to understand it. Understanding is not, not the thing in this case. It's just listening to it. Listen to the call of the shofar. That's the mitzvah, to listen, lishmoa, call shofar. And it's a very deep thing. It, it, it also occurs to me that you have, I wish we had a class. I mean, I wish we could sit for two more hours and analyze this. But there's a, what's also being pointed out is a big difference between masculine and feminine spirituality. Maybe, yes. The way, I mean, Kierkegaard makes Abraham into the knight of faith because he's willing to suspend his ethical sense, his conscience, and go kill his son at the command of his God. Yes. And Sarah is a different kind of hero and absorbs the world in a very different way. And the Midrash is, as you said, elevating and celebrating Sarah's way of protesting, of responding to this commandment of God. And I, I, it would be interesting to play out the masculine and feminine of this. I think that's a very interesting comment. Yes, thank you. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yes. That's what makes, I think, Sarah's death in itself so unbearable. Because the masculine side of us, <laughs> the masculine side of us wants a solution of some kind, wants some way of framing it. But she takes us to that most truthful core, which I think it's a very feminine. I think women live in the depths. They live in the in the interior, you know, the, 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 the sensitive interior. The, you know. And then he cries for her. For the first time in the Torah, Avram Avinu cries. And he cries because the woman who has been with him I mean, there's, we could spend another two hours on that one. He cries for her. All of a sudden, he identifies with her pain. Now, at the end, at the end of the story, not at the beginning of the story. I think you could even you could even come to a, make an argument for the fact that all the patriarchs, in a sense, cry for their wives. In the end, in the end, that is the. I, I don't know if we have time to go into that, but. But there is a sense of suddenly coming to get something about the feminine. At some point in the story, the husband gets something about the wife and cries. Um, there is a. Well, there's hope for us men yet. That, that's such hope, a beautiful message. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a beautiful <laughs> message. Aviva, Noah no and I have been exploring the rebirth of Jewish life all over the world. Communities of prayer that have sprung up communities of, of learning, communities of social justice, communities of uh, 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 exploring new ways of exploring the Jewish heart. And uh, you have been at the core of this. And tonight we have been privileged not only to explore your own shita, your own method, but also to learn with you. It's been a great honor. Thank you so very much. And for all you've contributed to the awakening of Jewish life worldwide. Chazak v'nit chazek, may you continue to have strength. You need to finish the Torah. For us congregational rabbis who wake up Shabbos morning looking for a few words of Torah, you've got to finish the five books, and then you've got to work through the rest of the books of Tanakh. God is going to give you long years and great strength because your shita is needed, and we appreciate all that you've given tonight. Thank you, and, and for all that you've done, thank you. Thank you, and Hatzlacha in Rabbi, in the, in the holy that you're doing. Thank you. Noah, thank you. It's good to see you. Take good care. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Aviva. And to everyone who's joined us this evening, thank you so very much. Join us on Wednesday evenings for the premiere of each of these interviews at 7 p.m. Uh, YouTube, Facebook, or wherever you find us online. Thank you for being with us and good night. <laughs>